You may be seated. <laughs> Welcome to church. Uh, if you are new, my name is Rodney. I'm the lead pastor at New Life. We have a team of pastors, uh, but I do a lot of the speaking. And so uh, I would love to get to know you, build a relationship with you, and so would our leadership team and people within the church. So what that means is you have connection cards. When you fill those out, uh, we take your information uh, please add your social security number, all your credit card information. Uh, we will sell it to uh, the highest bidder. But no, we, we won't do any of that, but we do want to know you. And if you take that specifically to starting point, you could turn it in with the offering uh, baskets or lock boxes out front. You can put that connection card in there. We'll get to know you that way. But everyone filling those out for prayer requests, et cetera. Uh, but if you're new, you can go to Starting Point. We have a gift for you, and it's going to initiate that conversation and engage you with us. So we want to know you. And as we get started, we have been in this short book of the Bible, 1 John, and we've been talking about God's heart from a father's perspective, and really John's heart as he's Jesus' best friend from now a grandpa, great-grandpa, age range perspective, and kind of how his life has changed. So John was passionate, John was a son of thunder, John didn't always have wisdom in the early part of Jesus' ministry. As he grew older, he grew wiser. He's been there, done that. He's about to die, go be with Jesus eternally. And in all of that, he, he starts telling us some core theology as a church that we need to own. And he's going to really dig into this reality of here is the truth and these are the lies. And he is going to say that repeatedly. For example, he starts the book off, God is light, in him there is no what? And no darkness. And so there is this contrast in how God operates. There is the truth and there is lies. There is good, there is evil. There is right, there is wrong. And the reason that's so important is since sin entered the world, we have been trying to convolute that process. And in trying to do so, really what we are saying is we are God, we call the shots. And just so you know, if you're new to the faith or you're new to just hearing the gospel, um, that doesn't work according to scripture, and that doesn't work according to reality, and you can use your own life as a case study as to how that's fallen short. And so we are looking at these truths. You can even see it through this lens. I heard Micah say this in study a few weeks ago before he went off to Peru to be with Chuck. Uh, he said, look at First John as a study guide to the gospel of John, because the gospel of John is Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, and then First John, before he dies, is kind of the theology that holds the reality of Jesus' life together. So he gives us kind of the backstory as to how things and why things are the way they are, not just the events in and of themselves. Um, Want to say this? I don't know if Mike, uh, or I don't know if Greg said it when I before I came in here. Uh, happy Super Bowl Sunday! I just feel like that needs to be said. Who in here could care less about the two teams? Yeah, it's one of those years, isn't it? It's like Taylor Swift, ah, you know, and it's like really again and and then the 49ers I mean how can you connect to the 49ers unless you're Michael Westby uh, in the Midwest it doesn't even make sense and so we just like the commercials and I don't even know who the halftime show is this year but uh, that way I just feel like that needs to be said because it's Sunday and, and moving on um, but as we get started turn your Bibles first John chapter 2 we're going verse by verse through this entire book it's actually taking longer than I thought and that's okay we'll figure it out uh, I feel like this is a great season of ministry for our church walking through these verses. But here it is. And if you are an end times guru or just get that satisfaction of watching the old Kirk Cameron movies over and over and over again, and you love the book of Revelation, uh, you're going to be a little disappointed because we're not completely going there. But, but here is some, some stuff that you like to hear. Ready? 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. Dun, 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 right? It's the last hour. Now, you know right away that was 2,000 years ago, so you need to make sense of that. But here it is. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. And so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. So let's address that, because how does that make sense? Well, I think the way to understand that is really to understand the overall plan of God. How could 2,000 years ago be the last hour? Well, understand it maybe through this framework of God's plan for salvation and his creation. God sees history in terms of periods more than seconds, minutes, weeks, or years. And so in God's mind when he is operating, 
he sees things from just different periods of time. So Adam and Eve, in the beginning, they sinned, and then the promise is, if we're just going to break this into kind of like before Jesus, Jesus, after Jesus, here's three simple time frames. Adam and Eve centered into the equation, and the promise is Jesus is coming, and then Jesus comes to earth, stage two, and I'm way oversimplifying this, for, uh, but, this but this is something we can all walk in. Jesus is on earth, stage two, Jesus lives, Jesus dies, Jesus rises, goes back to heaven, and then the third phase would be everything since then, which is then the last hour. And so until Christ returns, I think we're having technical difficulties. You don't need that screen. You just need to, oh, there it is. But if it goes out, no big deal. Just look at the scripture for yourself. But then everything after that is Jesus' imminent return, the, the second coming of Christ. And then the controversy begins when we start dissecting when that will be and camps are formed and lines are drawn and drama ensues. And it kind of, in the church, there's different theological issues that manifest where it becomes the hot topic issue of the day. I would say that right now, this is not the hot topic, but when I was growing up, 80s and 90s, there was huge, huge concern about Christ returning and arguments that ensued as a result of. And so it'll surface again, and it's always there because it's the Bible. But understand this, when John now at almost 100 years old is talking to the church, and he's going to get into heretical teachings within it, he's saying, hey, one of the ways we know that the last hour is upon us is because false teachers are running rampant. And the reality is this, that although it's been 2,000 years, we are still in that last hour. And obviously, we're 2,000 years closer. But in God's mind, he doesn't see days, weeks, months, years. He sees periods of time in which he operates. So before Christ, it was leading to Christ. When Christ came, it was the central time period in which salvation was ushered in. And now we are looking back at the gospel and the narrative with the Holy Spirit living in us. And we are saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. And we are seeing the exact same things that John is experiencing 2,000 years ago. What we don't know is the hour. We don't know when Christ is coming, but we know that he is coming. And so what we do is we wait with eager anticipation. And so then John gives this evidential support for the last hour by saying the Antichrist or Antichrist are upon us and are shortly coming. So what is he talking about? And this is where it gets like, you know, the end times people start perking up their ears because we want to dive into this. Well, he's talking about the way I've read it, the way I've studied it, two different things. When he talks about Antichrist, there are two different meanings. And he really lays them out in the text. He said, you've heard it said that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. So what does that mean? Well, uh, the two meanings are as followed. He's talking about those that are against us, those that are against the church, those that are actively working in the here and now to deceive in place of Jesus. And then he's also talking about this central figure to come. Before Christ comes back for his bride, that there will be somebody that has been established to deceive. But the basic definition of antichrist is simply to oppose Christ. Anti, to oppose. And so that's in the here and now. And you can look at maybe people that you've known in your life or central figures in history that have done mass damage or, you know, like those Hitler type of figures. They can be an antichrist type of person where they had an ideology that they worked in that was purely demonic and they used it to influence and murder millions and millions of people. It's that type of deception. But to understand it at its core, and this is what's important, to understand the idea and objective of the Antichrist at its core, you first have to understand Christianity. And so I want you to hear this statement. Christianity is not rooted in a place. Like we don't have a Mecca. The church is not rooted in a physical space. Christianity is not rooted in a place. It's rooted in a person and then that person's name is the God-man, fully God, fully man, Jesus Christ. And so it's all about worshiping Jesus. That, that is Christianity at its core. And maybe you've heard this, that in order to have the life that God's called you to have, you need to make Jesus the top priority in your life, true or false. Clearly that's true, but I think actually it's not the most accurate way to describe how Christianity works. I was listening to a guy talk about this this week, and it, and it challenged my own thinking, and I want to bring it before you as we move forward. 
So although Christ should be at the top of our priority list, it really doesn't quite play out that way. In fact, that could even be a religious type of way of thinking. And so if, if Jesus is at the top of, pri- of the priority list, then first you spend time with Jesus, and then you go to your job, and then you have time you know, with your family after and your hobbies, and so it's kind of like one, two, three, four, five. And I wake up each day, and I, Jesus is the top, so he gets the first time, and then everyone else falls in line. I don't think that when you read the Bible, you would come to that conclusion. I think the better way of thinking is that Jesus is at the center of everything. Do you see the distinction? And so if you look at your life in a circle, Jesus is at the center of the circle, and then from the center, because he is the absolute top priority. It's not like Jesus and then you do these other things. It's Jesus with everything else you do. Jesus with every way that you conceptualize the truth of the life that you walk in. And so Jesus is the center. Are you tracking? And now how does that affect your family? Jesus at the center, how does that affect the way that you see the cultural, the cultural norms around you? Jesus at the center, how does that impact the relationships you have in the workplace? Because religion wants to take a list and go, okay, I'm going to give this much to this and that much to that, and this is the place where I go, and this is the way that I serve. And then Jesus just shatters that, and he says, no, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am your very reason for breathing and living And in that, it affects everything else that you do, just like it did for the early church and the disciples. You give everything to Christ because he first gave everything to you. And so my point would be this. The the subheading is going to be, what's the goal of the Antichrist or the Antichrist that are currently trying to deceive close to you or that you listen to, and then ultimately the Antichrist to come before Christ returns? The goal of the Antichrist is to push Jesus from that center position. And just take a moment and think about that in your own life. What are those things that you're listening to, those people that are influencing you, that are taking that central position in your life, and then from that ideology, the rest of you operates? That's the goal of the Antichrist. In the future sense, it's that person that's walking by the power of Satan, bringing together spiritual, social, political capital to rule from a powerful, powerful position to bring in a formal opposition against the kingdom of God. That's a long definition. Of course, I didn't think of it, but I wrote that down. And so as we move forward, as you hear John's passionate plea to walk in truth rather than lies, just start from that position. There is a goal. The devil always has a goal. Demons always have a goal, and they don't have to really always work that hard because the flesh that we operate in gravitates towards these lies over the truth of the gospel. But the goal is always to take Christ out of this central position, and it can be so subtle. It can be so subtle. And then once he's out of the center, he can even look like he's at the top of the priority list, but when that top of the priority list isn't affecting every layer of change under it, then it's not the center, and that's the deception. But his goal is to take Christ out of the center. And John is saying, this is not okay. The end time is among us. He says in the next verse, and we're going to camp out here for a while. He says, they went out. Now he's talking about people who are following this false teaching where Jesus isn't at the center. These people, and just note, I'm going to think of, say things as I think of them. There's a lot here. They went out from us. Just note this. These people are coming from where? Inside the church. We go crazy as conservative Christians, as we should, about things happening outside of us. And we're going to watch the Super Bowl today through our Christian lens and go, I can't believe when I was a kid it wasn't. And we're going to have all of these statements Or maybe the worst reality is we're numb to it and just enjoy it. I mean, you should have a filter there, right? And we're going to say things that really kind of aren't true. It's so much worse. And I think, well, you didn't grow up in the 90s because it was really bad then too, right? Just go back and listen to some of the things that you thought don't do it, but you thought were okay when you were a teenager. Things have always been bad. There's just a new scheme to push Jesus out of the middle, and it's disturbing, but there's nothing new under the sun. They went out from us, but they were not of us. So here's the idea. Here's where we all lock in, that there are people that go to church that aren't Christians. 
There are people that are religious that aren't Christians. And the way that we know they're not Christians is because they are among us, but then they go out from us and they start spreading lies. And, and I'm not talking about messing up, but I'm talking about they have a whole other gospel that they adhere to. And really, and we'll get into this in a second, really we know that they're wolves when they're not just someone who's been deceived, but they're actively trying to deceive others with a false worldview. And it's not starting necessarily outside of the walls of church, but it's right here within the sanctuary. And so we need to be on guard and we need to be keeping Jesus at the center. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, not, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. So John is saying, don't make this mistake of missing the mark. And that's not saying that if you make the mistake of falling short, because that makes you human, that's why Jesus died, that somehow you're this person that's gone out from among us. There there are different ways of seeing this, and I think the apostles give the best analogy of a living, breathing example. There are different apostles, all of which fell short. At different points in the ministry, when Jesus' death, like, where did they go, right? They, They were cowardly. At Jesus' resurrection, things change. Their faith is building. In Jesus' earthly ministry, when the miracles are happening, all of a sudden they have more courage. But you see their, their ebb and flows, their ups and downs. But there's different types of disciples that really encapsulate this whole idea perfectly. So, for example, uh, someone like Peter, is he in or out? He's in, right? But he denies Christ three times. Well, how do you know that he's in still the faith? In fact, he's the rock of the church. He's a pillar of the movement. He, he's a central figure when Christ resurrects and ascends, and he goes from cowardly to bold. And it's not that he never falls short of the mark. He really misses the mark in his earthly ministry. But in doing so, he comes back humbly, and he owns where he's at with Jesus, and although Jesus gets pushed out of the center because his heart's for the Lord, it's evidentially and factually true, he brings him back to the center through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, an example of what it looks like to make mistake upon mistake upon mistake but still be in the circle is Peter's humble humble response of Jesus, you know, "I, I don't even deserve any of this, but I believe, and then he comes back into the fold. Now compare that to a guy like Judas. Judas, for three years, fakes it. You would have thought, you know, he's the guy that's in church every Sunday. He's the guy that can, can fake the script, can, can operate in, you know, Jesus says this and Jesus says that. And, and this, I'm a Christian and I'm a follower of Christ and I'm one of his disciples. And so he faked it to the point of, you know, he turned out to be a complete fraud. And those people are among us too. And John's warning against those different distinctions. And he's saying when people actually don't have the affection for Christ and the true belief in Christ, when their experience is rooted in worship of themselves and looking out for themselves, you will see them derail. And what he's saying in verse 19 is we can see this actually happening. It became plain that they were not all of us. And so then the basic idea is this, just because you're religious, look at me, just because you're religious does not mean you're saved. John's just laying that out there. There are these different debates, can you lose your salvation? I heard a guy say this week, you can't lose your salvation, but you can definitely fake it. You can fake it. Well, how can you fake it? Judas, fake, fraud, had a different agenda. John's saying there are true Christians, and the way that you know that there are true Christians is everyone walks away, but true Christians walk back. Think about this in your own life. I, I tell my own salvation story that I didn't understand the gospel until I got into college. In fact, I got into a Christian college, and I thought I was a Christian, but I, I truly believe that as I look back at my experience, when I found Christ and when I really understood what Christ did for me, I was a freshman in college, and God sovereignly ordained that moment in my life where he opened my eyes to the reality of the gospel. And I said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. And then since that, now I'm almost 44 years old, there has been an ebb and flow. 
You're like, oh, pastors are a certain way. Well, no, pastors struggle too. Pastors, you know, fall short of the mark. And that would be a clear example of, you know, there has been ebb and flows to my walk. There's been times where I felt like I just can't get enough of the word. There's been times where that's felt dry in my life, even before ministry. We have these seasons and these ebb and flows. And so when you start to metaphorically or emotionally or spiritually walk away, what happens with the Holy Spirit's abiding in you, you come back because he is the center. And that is so different than people that say they operate in a certain subset of beliefs, but there's no impact in their life to really give evidence that that's true. Think about your life. Think about people that you've known. And really, it goes back to last week. Only God can judge me. God is the judge, and only God knows. We, we can't play God and his sovereignty and know exactly individually how this this works for everyone else around us, but have you not seen times in your life where you've gone, you know, I've seen that person, I know they have a genuine affection for Christ, and then they started dating someone that wasn't a believer, or this happened, or that happened, and, and they went through these seasons of life, and, and you feel like, you know, they still know the Lord, but they're struggling. That's called reality. A lot of times we walk through something like that. Versus people you've known that you've said, I, I think they believe this, and I think they believe that, and they have completely reneged on everything they said they believed. Am I the only one? You never met anyone like that, right? One of the ways that we talk about it in, in ministry or in leadership is kind of this idea that sheep go astray, but, but there's a difference between, and our pastors talk about this often, not about you, about everyone else in every other church, but there's a difference between sheep and wolves. Because sheep go astray, but wolves are actively attempting to deceive and bring down the flock. And so when that's the case, then it's, it looks a lot different. And so he, here he moves forward because he's talking about not sheep that have gone astray, but wolves who are looking to tear down. And now it's going to get really detailed about what's going on 2,000 years ago. 1 John 2, verse 20. He says this, but you, like every time he starts saying the good news, he's saying, but you guys are the good guys, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. Maybe another way of understanding that is you're operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you have all the knowledge. And I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. That's a great verse to memorize, side note. But here's the next. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning aid in you if you want uh, if you if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father, and this is the promise that He has made to us eternal life. So the next type of statement, because this whole idea is built on how do we know God, and so the first part is here is the last hour, here's the deception that's going to come upon you. But then the other reality is this. Here's what he's unpacking. If, if you're in lies, there's no truth in you. You can't have both. God is not an Eastern mystic God. It's not that he is truth and lies. It's not that he is dark and lightness. That's how we started the sermon series. No, he is truth, and him there is no lies. He is light, and him there is no darkness. And so to know the truth means to be absent of lies in your life when it comes to understanding who God is. And if you really want to know someone, if you really want to know someone, you have to know what they're about. Have you ever had this reality where you've walked with someone, maybe even for years, and it's been incredibly painful because you thought you knew them, and it turns out you didn't? Maybe on a personal level you haven't experienced that, but maybe because of the world we live in where you can see everyone's lives on display, how many of us have been disappointed by a public figure that we thought we knew, and it turns out we didn't actually know them? We we're talking in study this past Wednesday about Christian figures where that's been a reality, and the, the name Ravi Zacharias got brought up a pillar, supposedly, of the faith, a defender of the faith. He could answer any question about Jesus at any time uh, in a way that no one else I've ever heard could even accomplish. And yet he was doing horrible, deceptive things behind the scenes that after he died came to light. And it was just so painful. I think of all the people, I mean, some people that fall, you go, yeah, I could kind of see that. I always thought maybe. That guy, no one saw it coming, and it just hit everyone like a two-by-four that loves Jesus across the face. 
But the reality is this, you have to know the truth and you have to operate in the truth and you can't really know someone until you actually know what they are really about. And so that's how we know the truth, what they are really about. Who is Jesus and what is he really about? What does he really say? That's what John's unpacking for the church 2,000 years ago. I think a couple of weeks ago, I, I went off on this tangent about the courtroom morally that we stand before God and that we have this defense attorney named Jesus. We talked about it yesterday at a funeral again. And do you remember what I told you? I said, there is this guy in the 80s named Ted Bundy kind of a less than perfect figure in the fact that he was a mass murderer. And for whatever twisted reason, I kind of study those types of things. I love watching those documentaries. And he made this catastrophic mistake in his narcissism where he said to himself, there's no one better to defend me than me because I'm all-knowing. And he put himself in the courtroom as the defense attorney. And he absolutely was found guilty and fried in the electric chair. Do you remember that heartwarming story? Because I have another one for you. We're going to keep running with that analogy. In the study of serial killers and the ultimate depravity of man, the creepiest serial killer of all time for me is not Ted Bundy. It's this guy named Dennis Rader. Have you ever heard of him? Maybe you've heard of this, the BTK killer. We won't even get into how that acronym breaks down because it's disturbing. You know where that guy's from? No, there's only one twisted mind and he's standing on stage. He's from Kansas. Like, we're not in Kansas anymore. Thank God. <laughs> Dorothy got it wrong. So this guy's from Kansas. He's operating, I think, close to Topeka or Kansas City. Uh, what makes him so disturbing, what makes him for me the worst of the worst, is that most serial killers have a couple of common things. They are, they are people that don't form any bonding relationships. They tend not to be married. They tend to hurt animals at a small age. They're manipulative and diabolical, but they never stay in one location because they have no authentic relationships. This guy, Dennis, he's still alive. He's still in prison in Kansas. He is absolutely diabolical in the sense that he had a wife, he had a daughter, and he had a church that was this Lutheran church for 30 years where he was in leadership. And all the while, he was murdering families in their homes, wreaking havoc on the Midwest. That, that's kind of next level. Amen? That's next level. But what's so conflicting is his daughter was interviewed and she said, I feel so weird about this because he was a good dad. He engaged that relationship with me. He seemed perfectly normal. And so I have this dad figure and then I have this monster figure and I'm trying to, she probably got paid big money for this interview because everyone wants to know how a mind like this can tick. And I'm trying to separate these two realities in my mind between dad and mass murder and I can't make sense of it. And my point is this, to know someone you can't just have a view of them. You actually have to know them in the reality of what they believe and they, how they operate. And so Paul or Paul John is saying to his church, man, you have to be able to distinguish truth from lies. And to really know Jesus, you have to know the truth about him because the truth matters. And then culturally, the reason he's going there is because there were lies all around the church. They were starting outside in culture. They were infiltrating into the church. And then they were coming outside of the church in a way that was watered down and deceptive, just like today. It was known as Gnosticism. Write it down. It starts with a G. The G is silent. But when we, when we have this intellectual or chronological snobbery of our day where we think, we have information that no one else had, and life is different, and these social views are different, and we've been enlightened. Just, just know this in a bit of humility. C.S. Lewis says this, one of the core realities of this era of living is chronological snobbery, where we think we have information, and we think we have enlightenment that no one else has had before us, when in truth, if you study history, there's nothing new under the sun. 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, John, in his old age, was dealing with the exact same garbage that we deal with today. The Gnostics were really spawning. It was a cult. They were spawning from two different ideological perspectives. It was Eastern mystic influence uh, as well as Greek dualism. And there was a basic idea that they walked in, and it seemed at surface level fairly harmless until you started unpacking the package. And then you see things how they really were because you see the manifestations of the bad starting point. But their bad starting point was 
non-material is good, so spirit is good, material is bad. Anything in the material realm is bad. But then, of course, because it had a wrong starting point, it went further. Because the material is evil, the world itself in a physical sense is evil. And here's where they derail. 2,000 years ago, it started with John and the church, and then it really took off in the second century. But here's where the train completely left the station. If the material is evil, then God could not have created earth because earth is evil. And so God that we know of in the Old Testament is really just a mini-God, and there's a God over him, and now we are clearly in blasphemous territory, and John is saying, stop the truck Hold the train. We have to address this issue. When you are operating in lies, there is no truth in you. When you are operating in truth, there is no lies in you. They took it a step further. They said, because the spirit realm is the only thing that's good and God has to operate in it, God himself has a son named Jesus. Many God has a son named Jesus, and Jesus is a spirit. He actually didn't become man in the flesh. When he died on the cross, it was spiritual, and he was no man. And so false theology always holds to one of two positions. One is that God is just God, or Jesus is just God and not man. And the other is that Jesus is just man, more popular view, and not God. Thus, the ideology I believe in Jesus, he was a good guy. Well, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or the savior. You can't have it both ways. But for these guys, he was the spirit, but he was not the man. And if he's the spirit and he's not the man, then how is he going to take your place for your sins on that cross and give new life through the work of the cross? He can't. It sounds subtle, but lies always do. Making it more practical, 2,000 years later, we have the same things that have manifested. I'm not even talking about the cultural things that gets all of our hair raised in this generation. I'm talking about movements that have become large. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. They claim Christianity. But really, I mean, just to be perfectly frank, they, they have all the makings of a cult because they take Jesus out of the center and they replace him in his deity as something that he is not. Because cults always take Jesus out of the Savior, uh, out of the center, and, and Antichrist always take Jesus out of the center. If you ask a Mormon what they believe about God, the only God eternal created God, they would say, no, we don't believe that. We believe that he's a created being. God the Father had relations with Mary, and he is a man who became God. And, and here's the good news for Mormons. You can do the same thing that Jesus did. He started as a man who became a God, and he got his own planet. And you know what the planet was called? Planet Earth. And you know what the good news is for you? You can be a man that becomes God. And if you work your way through the religious system of Mormonism, and they don't tell you the surface level, they don't want to give all this to you right at the beginning because they don't want you to know the difference, that you can get your own celestial planet too. And you can have your many wives in heaven. That's the truth of what they believe. This is the golden tablets where Joseph got the secret information. Jehovah's Witnesses believe this about Jesus, that he's actually the archangel Michael that God created before the physical world existed. And when they start talking about Jesus' birth, it's very different. When Jesus was born on earth, he was a human and not God in human flesh. When Jesus resurrected, he resurrected spiritually from the dead, but not physically. When they start talking about where John's going, Jesus' second coming and the Antichrist to come, they, they had this epiphany. That in 1914, we all missed it. He already came. And say, well, how did we not know that? Because it's the secret information that only they have. And he came in the invisible realm. And salvation requires faith in Christ plus, and this is every cult, plus, how do you know you're off the rails? Plus, salvation comes from Christ plus being a part of the Jehovah's Witness organization. Gnosticism. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, pick your poison. But we're not talking about his secondary issues. How how do you know that we're all walking together even when we can't agree on everything? Jesus Christ came to earth, the Son of God, as a baby. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. Jesus Christ died a death as fully God and fully man in our place so that 
we could be reconciled to God, the perfect and just God, sins forgiven, relationship with the Father, reconciled, adopted in. He rose from the dead, and he's coming back for his bride. And this word that he gives us is an errant, and it is his word, and he's not a way. This is how you know you have not derailed the station. He's not a way. He's the way. He is the only way to heaven. Praise God. He is the Son of God, fully man, fully God, on earth, in our place, for our sins. That's the gospel, and so that's what we don't compromise on. Secondary issues, I mean, we could talk a while, right? Issues that are more ingrained in the culture of each individual place of worship. Should I raise my hand? Should I, you know, I mean, just pick your poison. There are all sorts of secondary issues that we can divide on. Even this whole idea of the end times. I guarantee you, we start polling people in this group, There's going to be some that say, I have no idea. There's going to be some that say it has to be like this. There's going to be others that say, no, that you're getting it all wrong. It's got to be like that. At the end of the day, Jesus is coming back. Amen. We're going to walk in that together, but it's not going to divide the church. These are core issues. When we start talking about the authority of Scripture, these moral issues that really guide us, should we raise our hands? Secondary issue. When's the return of Christ? Secondary issue. How does predestination work? Secondary issue. We have different views on how these things work. The gospel is central. I heard it like this. I might preach long today. I'm just going to keep rolling. Take some, here we go. I don't really care today. Uh, board, think about it. I heard this analogy, and we'll move on from this to the next point, the last point. Think about it in terms of Christianity, and I'm not saying you, the U.S. is a Christian nation. I get that it's post-Christian. I get that a lot of people aren't Christians. But don't, just in the physical realm, think of it in terms of the U.S. or even another country. Christianity, where we walk in secondary issues, but we all walk together, we all travel the same path, it's like the understanding of each state is different, but it's all a part of the United States of America. And so you, so you can get in your car, and you can go to North Dakota, and you can go to Minnesota, if, you have, you know, if, you're, if you're really operating in the Spirit of God, you can travel to Minnesota, but, but you can go to Minnesota, or you can go wherever, and it's like all that happens is you recognize you're in a different space, but it's all the same, and you just see this little sign, welcome to Wisconsin, or welcome to this, or welcome to that, and they have a different flair, but it's all America. And, and, and then the difference of if you get to Peru where Chuck and Mike are at and you go to the airport as soon as you get to Miami or you get to Texas now you got to go through customs now you need a passport because it's not one thing with different views it's an entirely different thing and when you get outside of the U.S. spiritually when you get outside of Christianity you don't just need to drive by the border you have to get the passport out and go through customs because you're not dealing with the same thing. It's now apples and oranges. The rules are different. Everything has changed. And so we stay unified on those things that unify. And then at the same time, at the same time, those things that are absolutely, this isn't Christian, we die on those hills. Verse 22 Who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you have heard from the beginning aid you, if what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, that you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that God has made again, eternal life. Before we move on, I wanted to read that again and just bring this reality to light. The one who denies that Jesus is the Christ has no part of a relationship with the Father. The one who manipulates the reality of Jesus being the Christ. The one that takes Jesus out of the center in manipulative and subtle lies has no part with the Father. You cannot take the core doctrine of the faith and start convoluting it and twisting it and then somehow still be in it because now you're not a sheep who's gone astray you're a wolf who's trying to deceive and to deny Christ is to deny the resurrection to deny Christ is to die his 
his godship in the Trinity, to deny Christ is to deny his 100% all God, all man status. And so it's off the table. And you will find that anyone who confuses the Son then has the spirit of the Antichrist when they're actively trying to deceive those around them. Because they are literally anti-Christ. This is the world that we live in 2,000 years ago. This is the world that we live in now. I, I heard it said this way. It's like when it comes to Jesus' Godship, our Godhead, and, and, or Jesus' 100% God and 100% man, it's like two oars of a boat. That in order to row that thing appropriately, you have to own both realities because as soon as you go, Jesus is fully God, but not man, there's no means of salvation. And as soon as you go, God, Jesus is fully man and not God, there's no means of salvation because a man can't save. And the, the man in his deity is the one who was crucified in our place so that we could be saved. And so John is emphatic that the church owns this reality and this Gnostic garbage that they were operating in. Last verses, verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as, he is, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has been taught, abide in him. Have you guys seen the common denominator week after week after week? Old John, soon to die John. John that was this restless, charged figure when his younger life is now calmed down. You, you guys, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to be great grandpa. Abide in Christ, abide in Christ, abide in Christ, abide in Christ. So when it comes to knowing God, there are two different facets to be examined. Here's the last one. The first is you have to know who the person actually is or know who God actually is. And the second reality is you have to know God personally. And that's the process through the Holy Spirit of abiding. That's the Holy Spirit at work in your life because you can know everything about something just like Satan does, but you cannot be a part of that relationship with the Savior. How do I stay the course? I abide. What does abiding mean according to the great theologian Siri? A feeling or memory without fading or being lost. Spending time with Christ. Jesus says, if you abide in me, you'll bear fruit, fruit that will last. It's just like your marriage, right? Who in here is married? Happily. Happily. It's just like your marriage. I could tell you so many things about my wife. How much time you got? How much you got? She can't tell you anything about me. It's all good. But I could tell you so many things. I mean, we, we started, the good news is we started dating young. The bad news is we started dating young. I see some of you when I'm looking around the room. It's like you started real young and then you got married and you go, oh my goodness, they're not perfect like me, right? But when you abide, when you really know them, you know the good, the bad, and the ugly, just like God knows these things about us, and it's personal. And then you choose to love them just because, although Christ is perfect, we're a broken bride, just like Christ chooses to love and sacrifice for us. And so there's good parts of that from a marriage analogy and bad parts. The bad parts is, if you started young, you probably made a lot of mistakes. The, the good news is, if you started young, you have this bond with them where you've abided in them through the thick and the thin for a very long time. That's Anne and I's story. It's personal. It's, I love you at more than face value because I see you for who you truly are and we are choosing to now 24 years in still be intimately connected in this covenant through the good the bad and the ugly we are going to abide on a very personal level in each other I, I can remember memories from when we were really young and stupid, that there's still emotional connection points. If I hear a song on the radio or, or have an experience, it's like, well, that was the time when we were in college, and this is the time when we got married, and this is the time where our life changed, and we had these kids that are now teenagers and just sucking the life out of us because we've lived this together. I'll be at the second service. But the point is, we're intimately connected to the process and commitment of abiding. Abiding is not distracted. Abiding is focused. Abiding, even when drifting begins, gets pulled back to the center. An abiding life that walks in the truth is a powerful witness to the world around it. I got this micro-parent obituary. Praise team can come back up. I didn't even go that long. 
I did a funeral yesterday. I just want you to see what it looks like. Daniel Vern Stecker. I never knew his middle name was Vern until yesterday. Dan's journey in sports began when he joined the Aberdeen swim team. He later discovered football, which quickly became his favorite and remained one of his many hobbies throughout his life. Graduating as the homecoming king from Aberdeen Central High School in the class of 1985, kind of think Karate Kid at its prime, his life took a transformative turn after a car accident that led him to an extensive rehabilitation during this time. Dan showed great resilience and found solace in his faith, accepting Christ as his Savior. His niece wrote this about him. A passionate follower of Christ, Dan actively participated in Bible studies and demonstrated profound knowledge of God's word. He continually shared the message of his unwavering faith, ultimately winning many hearts to the Lord. And I'm just going to stop it there. Praise team, you can come back up. You can take this thing. I'm done with this. I, I just want you to hear that reality. That's what it looks like to abide in truth. That doesn't mean perfect. That means that Christ is at the center. And so as we close this time in prayer and we all stand up in just a second to sing some songs, I I just want to take this little moment with you and say, where are you at? Is this your narrative? Is this your story? We are all less than perfect and believe lies when we should be believing truth. But are we centered on the gospel where the Holy Spirit's working and abiding in us where we then say, you know what? I've been doing that, but the Holy Spirit is showing me this. The Holy Spirit's showing me that. These are the cultural things that are devastating me. And I'm centering my life and my family on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are going to be anchored in this place called new life because the truth is going out. And we are going to all about, be all about Jesus Christ. And we're not just going to know these truths versus lies. We're going to abide in him and we're going to have affection for him. And there's going to be fruit that bears as a reality of him in our life. And we are going to be light in the darkness. We're going to be the salt of the earth. Let's stand up. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We want to know you in your truth. We want to know you in your death. We want to know you in your resurrection. But we don't want to stop the knowledge at a place of intellect. We want, to start, we want the knowledge to continue through the process of the intimate and personal relationship with you. And we want to abide just like a marriage covenant. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for the truth. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen.